This is the Media Police Post broadcasting from the Fort Hall School of Government. In this show, we police the state of truth in the Republic. And because truth is communicated to us by journalists and analysts, we have made it our civic duty at the Fort Hall School of Government to put it to the test. We advance from two confirmed truths about the media. One, and according to Roger Stone, the media is either lazy or evil. And for the most part, it is both evil and lazy. That is why the truth, their truth, must be put to a test. Two, that journalism is verified gossip. In fact, what is presented to us as news analysis is gossip that has been verified by journalists. This gossip has to be grand truth. We will assess the state of truth and what they submit to the Republic, and we will pass verdict on what is true and what is not. For the record, we are not journalists, we are thinkers. We are not lazy or evil, and we do not verify gossip. What we give you is the truth, the truth that sets you free. On today's show, we will discuss ideas that reflect unformed and uninformed opinions and ideas that made you stupid. Narratives that fell into the cognitive trap of we see things as we are and not as they are. And narratives based on conjecture history and those that smack of envelope journalism. Welcome, Ms. K and Chaka. Sante. Thank you. Today, we congratulate the Zambian president-elect, His Excellency Hakainde Hichilema, or HH as he's fondly referred to, for becoming the seventh president of the Republic of Zambia. We are reminded of the Nigerian proverb that goes, with time and patience, the needle digs the well. Mm. Indeed, this president-elect is a work of patience, and we celebrate that. At the Fort Hall School of Government, we are particularly proud of this win because HH's path to the presidency mirrors that of our very own Raila Odinga. And we pray that HH's good fortunes extend to Raila in 2022. Mm -hmm. We say that the paths of Odinga, Raila Odinga and HH are a mirror image for three reasons. The first reason is the most obvious reason. Raila and HH are both veteran opposition leaders. HH has been in the opposition for 15 years, Raila for 24 years or 55 years if you are to add his internship with his father Jaramogi. <laughs> if William Ruto were to become president today, power would not shift from the ruling party to the opposition as the case is in Zambia today. The transfer of power would be from government to government mm. or government 1A to government 1B same difference. <laughs> the second reason is that both Raila and HH have been on the presidential ballot box five times. Mm -hmm. HH in 2006, 2008, 2011, 2015 and 2016 and Raila in 1997, 2007, 2013, 8th August 2017 and 26th October 2017. HH ran against the incumbent at Galungu three times and Raila ran against Uhuru Kenyatta three times. Mm. And the third and final reason is that both Raila and HH have been accused of treason, arrested and inhumanely tortured while in detention. HH's prison ordeal was under the reign of Edgar Lungu and Raila Odinga, the Baba man, was held in detention after the 1982 coup attempt. And lest we forget, Raila was detained with two Kikuyus, Ken Matiba and Charles Rubia after the Saba Saba riots of 1990. Mm. And that is how we got multi-party democracy. Mm. In the meantime, Ruto has only seen prison from the Facebook, TikTok, and what Sudi sent him on WhatsApp. Oh. <laughs> and so we ask, if HH of Zambia is a revolution, who is the revolution in Kenya? Mm. What we know is that Ruto is not. He's just a paper tiger revolutionary riding on the political ignorance of poor workers using economic slogans like bottoms up, whatever that means. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, but Ruto, beyond seeing prison on WhatsApp, <laughs> we still recall that there's something called the ICC, so the script is still being written. True, true. In a week that may likely echo through history, we are at the proverbial fork in the road. The court, in issuing its decision on BBI this Friday, will map out a, a path through its reasoning that may help clarify which way the pull of destiny will beckon. All said and done, However, the court chooses to address itself to the mechanics of how to popularly initiate constitutional changes. However, that is decided. In the final analysis, if citizens truly believe in having more citizen participation at devolved levels and more women in parliament and more accountability, then these ideas will eventually carry the day. 
Even if it means finding an alternate route to the promised land. For example, whatever may be decided about the process of popular reform, the people still have parliament. Yeah. It is, after all, theirs. So let us not be surprised if, after the Court of Appeal decision, a parliamentary initiative kicks off, securing what can be secured through parliament. Then thereafter, the few Article 255 stroke 257 mandatory referendum issues can be pursued through a popular initiative. This option is especially appealing if the Supreme Court may still be roped in to deliberate issues pertaining to a popular initiative. Ultimately, the court's decision will set off a domino effect. All eyes will be watching the seven-judge bench this Friday, for there is much at stake. And it is unfortunate that people buy into the DP's propaganda when he rouses popular sentiments by ridiculing BBI's scheme to share positions. What this reveals is that William Ruto is unashamedly bold in his dishonesty. It is clear that the real reason Ruto opposes BBI is because one, he does not believe in inclusion and diversity, and two, he does not believe in devolution. These two issues are key pillars in our current constitution, which BBI seeks to enhance. But if Ruto vehemently opposed the current constitution from inception, should we expect him to support its improvement? William Ruto would prefer a national executive where he has more power and control and less accountability. And he desires to be as much as possible the dominant voice dictating where resources will be allocated. The paradox is he doesn't detest all the BBI proposals. He knows that BBI gives him a path to carrying a bigger constituency even if he pretends not to be interested in sharing positions. Because even if he doesn't believe in inclusions, he is aware that Kenya's many nations do care about representation. So he knows it gives him more bargaining chips to dish out to the political leaders in his pocket. Secondly, Ruto doesn't mind too much if BBI carries the day because it holds the keys to his political survival. The one advantage Ruto has at present is incumbency. But it is not guaranteed that he will be an incumbent going into the election. Impeachment is still synonymous with his name. Impeachment makes it more likely that he will lose the presidency but come in second, thereby becoming leader of the official opposition, which is an office proposed by BBI. This will help him remain relevant because losing 2022 may not sound a death knell on his presidential ambitions. He knows it, and this is why he even advocated for it when he spoke at Chatham House in London, where he gave a speech in which he made the case for the office of leader of the official opposition. The current formulation undermines executive accountability and saddles us with, or saddled our democracy with a headless, incoherent, and dysfunctional opposition. The Constitution neither recognizes nor creates the functions of the official opposition. It is not proper that the leader of a party garnering the second highest votes has no formal constitutional role. Elections in Kenya are close-run contest. Often enough, the winner and the runner-up achieve more than five million votes. The winner ascends to a formally constituted constitutional leadership role, while the runner-up becomes a virtual stranger in leadership. My suggestions are as follows. First, the national government should be reconfigured to comprise the national executive headed by the president and the official opposition headed by the leader of the party or coalition of parties whose presidential candidate wins the second highest votes. That is good for accountability. And secondly, it removes or mitigates the winner-take-all perception. The leader of the party which becomes second becomes the leader of the opposition and with his or her running mate automatically becomes members of parliament and assume the leadership of official opposition. So who is fooling who? Do not let this man carry you malenge. I like that. And everyone should watch that Chatham House uh, interview. Mm -hmm. So, dear One Kenya Alliance, 
Today, as you lay your head down after the Naivasha meeting, I want to comb you for a few minutes. After all, my work is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So here goes. You need Raila more than he needs you. So while our, your time in Mombasa last week must have been nice, that was the first nudge to take coalition making seriously. The deliber deliberations sorry, of today are hugely important for the country and your benefit. So if the man to beat is Ruto, who will offer the One Kenya Alliance a chance to get to 50% plus one or a runoff situation? In political economy, forming a minimal winning coalition means a rational politician tries to form a coalition that is as large as necessary to win, but not larger. This means that in this political marketplace, you must reflect seriously on your actual worth. The big mistake in elite consensus bargains is for one to overestimate one's worth. It would appear that Raila has demonstrated his worth in, in, in elections five times, and each time his voting bloc remains intact at an average of 44%. Using history and numbers, Raila seems to offer the highest payoff as the anchor tenant of any coalition. And he currently holds the upper hand because, for instance, when Kalonzo did not support Raila in 2007, he still attained his average of 44%. And when Mudavidi did not support Raila in 2013, Raila still attained his average of 44%. Raila is being polite, actually, bringing them to the table, because he may not need them, all of them in the constellation that they are. Raila also has a secret weapon this time round. Thanks to Uhuru Kenyatta, he has hived off some of Gemma's influentials. So months ago, at the Fifth Estate, I submitted that as, politic, uh, as politics unfolds and strategy unfolds, three things should be observed. One, a good coalition maker must be ruthless. Identify your freeloaders quickly and get rid of them. So for example, if Kalonzo refuses to play ball, Terry Tingilu can easily replace him and take back her Kamba mm. constituency. Number two, should BBI not come to pass this week, what will be the other ways to offer incentives? And three, we must call out political loners, the people who seem power hungry, those who encourage groupthink and work only within closed circles. So consider that right now, Ruto has no coalition, which surely makes anything anyone else comes up with a bonus. So on that note, thank you for joining us. Thank you for channeling us. <laughs> <laughs> on the Media Police post, um, kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put you on notice. See you next Monday.